Well, Ms. Corbin, why don't you start talking about the Brookshire family and uh, their experiences in Cherokee County. Okay, my great-grandparents on the Brookshire side of the family, um, they lived in Cherokee County. They had a farm, and the farm was located on uh, Highway 92, Old Alabama Road, uh, right before you get to the Oak Grove Church. There was like 40 acres. And my great-grandfather, John B., he came in the 20, or well, right before 1920, he came into Ackworth and he built a home and a store next door, and it was called Brookshire Store, and they referred to that um, railroad crossing there as Brookshire's Crossing because people would say, you know, Brookshire's Crossing at Brookshire Store. Mm -hmm. So um, he was there, like I said, in the 1920s, and, um, and that's Southside Drive. Southside Drive. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there was a railroad crossing there at the time. And um, that's where, let's see, his, his son then, uh, my father's father was um, Junius, a senior, and my father's Junius, a uh, junior. <laughs> so um, he. Um, he got killed. His my grandfather got killed on that railroad crossing in 1943, oh my March of 1943, along with one of his brothers plus a son-in-law of his. And this was in that was in 19 railroad the railroad crossing right there in front of the store actually, oh because they would run they would um, work on the farm during the day. I mean, they would come to the mill and work during the day, morning mm -hmm. hours, and then they'd work the farm in the afternoons. Mm -hmm. So um, they were coming to work one morning at the cotton mill, mm -hmm. and um, it was in March, and they were saying, you know, there was a lot of fog and stuff like that. So at that time, there wasn't things that stopped the trains, mm -hmm. and you know, so they, they crossed over, and actually my great-grandmother she always looked out the window when she knew it was time for them to come, and she actually had just seen them go to the railroad crossing. And when she moved the curtain back after she had looked out the window, she she always said, "There goes Junius," and you know she would call their names. And they got hit by the train. And like I said, that was in 1943. Um, my parents had moved to. Uh, the Coast and Clark Mill Village uh -huh. around 1940. Because okay, so um, on the, the farm, um, John owned the farm, but Junius was senior, his son was operating it. Yes, and, and his then brother. Your father was helping them. Well, my father, at that time, they he moved to Coates and Clark, but prior to that, I'm sure, you know, that okay, he had... so your father was working for Coates and Clark? Yes. And what did he do there? Well, he was in um, the spinning room, what they call the spinning room. Mm -hmm. When it first, when he first came to the mill village, uh, moved to the mill village, they, um, I think it was called um, Ackworth, well, prior to that, it was called Ackworth Mill, the Seals mm -hmm. sisters had uh -huh. purchased the mill. Mm -hmm. And I think Mr. Mason, that had married Esther Seals, yeah. um, he, um, my father always called it Mason's Mill. Or was it, it was Helen, wasn't it? Oh, maybe it was Helen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I shouldn't but there was, Helen, there was Helen, um, was the sister, the sisters had purchased it, yeah. the Seals sisters. Uh -huh. But anyway, my father came um, to work there. And um, my youngest brother was born in 1942, so he was born there mm -hmm. on what was called Middle Road then, but mm -hmm. it's Clarkdale now. Mm -hmm. And um, I was born on Tacoa Drive, which mm -hmm. was referred to as Mud Row. And, and why, why was that? Uh, because <laughs> there was a lot of places on the road that always, when it rained, you know, there was always puddles, as we called them, but they were fun because we would go and <laughs> walk around and splash in them. But um, it was called Mud Road because, you know, it was 
a dirt road and it stayed now, muddy. Now it's quite a bit of distance, it looks to me, between Clarkdale Drive and Tacoa. Right. And the Mill Village occupies all that territory in between? Yes, and actually, um, there was a lot of people maybe that thought we were poor, mm -hmm. but I don't ever think about that because I always had clothes that we bought at Green's department store, Eaton's mm -hmm. department store. Um, there was uh, several um, grocery service station stores around, and uh, there was one at the north end, uh, Grover Cheatham's, had a store over there, and it was over across the railroad at the north end of Tacoa Mudro. Mm -hmm. And then the Grogan brothers, Paul and Henry Grogan, mm -hmm. they had a store at the south end of the street. Mm -hmm. So you ha actually had, you know, stores that you could walk to. Mm -hmm. And there was one across what was called Dixie Highway at the time that Herman Beavers owned, and Tommy Long's mother Mildred and her sister Aline Hill um, worked at Mr. Beaver's store. And Tommy Long, they lived down the street from the store on Dixie Highway and right across from where we lived on Tacoa Drive. So we had a lot of friends that actually weren't there in the village, but they came to the village to play Mm -hmm. And we had uh, a place on Tacoa Drive that we referred to as the Resi because it was an old reservoir. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would go, I was a tomboy, so we would go up there, two or three other girls in the, in the neighborhood, and boys would come, actually Mac Turner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, Ralph Matmick, and we had a friend, Martha Adams uh, Franklin, now, um, she would come over and we would all uh, play ball and we had a place on between Thomasville Drive and Clarkdale Drive that was, uh, we called uh, the Flats. Mm -hmm. I know there's a Flats at the elementary school, but we also called that one the Flats. Mm -hmm. And um, when we would start somewhere to play, we would say, we're going to the flats, mm -hmm. or we're going to the resi, mm -hmm. or we're going behind the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And our parents would always know, you know, where we were. Mm -hmm. And the parents on those streets would always look after the other parents, I mean, the kids of the other parents. Mm -hmm. And um, if we got in trouble, they knew it before we got back home. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, maybe going to my mom's side of the family, that uh, her last name was Pope, mm -hmm. and they lived out in Cherokee County, and they had a farm that was uh, is, was located where the uh, Rolling Hill Cemetery is now, which is on the north end of the uh, Oak Grove Church. Uh -huh. So the Brookshires and the Popes weren't that far apart. Exactly, yeah, and um, so like I said, once we moved to the Mill Village. It was just a different, you know, for them. But that's the only thing I knew because that's where I was born. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you all moved there, the, the Seals or Masons still owned the mill? As far as I And then just a few years later, I guess Colts and Clark? Well, I think it started off as um, Clark Thread Clark Company, and then it went to Coates and Clark. Mm -hmm. But um, my dad, he was um, in the spinning room. And um, my mother, excuse me. Did your mother work in the mill also? My mother didn't work in the mill. She was a housewife, but she did work um, some at the company, what was called the company store. Mm -hmm. They had a little I place. To ask you about that. I thought there was a company store. Yeah, they had a little, it was located on uh, the main street coming out of town. Oh, okay. And uh, it was right there at the Shady Grove Church was all, also there. Okay. And that was just across, 
in between Thomas Thomasville Drive and the main highway. Okay. Now, um, I guess by the time you started the school, the Eli Whitney School was no longer right. operating? Let's see. My four older siblings attended um, Eli that school. Yeah. Where, where was the company store in relation to where the Eli Whitney School was, which is BD's Barbecue? Okay. It's... Um, Across Thomasville, and but it was located on the Old Dixie Highway, oh, okay. right there at the church. Actually, the church was on Thomasville, and the store was there on Dixie Highway. Okay. Now and, you you mentioned uh, your your uh, great grandfather had the store in Ackworth on Southside Drive, right? And that building is still there. Yes. Right? And um, you mentioned a cotton mill. What, uh, did he own that too, or was that the same? No, it was the one that we referred to that the Seals sisters owned. Okay. And it was across the railroad from that. I mean, uh, uh, cotton. Uh, cotton uh, oh, okay. okay. It was oh, just called. Sure. Okay. It was just called a cotton mill then. Right. And later it became Coast and Clark Thread Mill. Okay, I, I just got confused. <laughs> I was thinking cotton gin, and no. you were talking cotton mill. Um, okay, so but he has he had his store, and, and what what did he actually sell in his store? Just uh, you know things like flour, sugar, uh -huh. you know meal, just you know things like that. So it's and kind of uh, a general store. Yeah, general store and. Um, Fresh vegetables, you know, in the season. And um, when we were growing up, um, of course, I don't remember them, him, but I remember my great grandmother. Uh -huh. And um, we would go over to the house, and I, I can remember sitting on that front porch at the house that still remains there on the right, right side of the store, and. Um, we had, like I said, we were back and forth mm -hmm. across the railroad, and our friends were. And actually, my husband told me this the other night, Jerry, my husband, Jerry Corbin, uh -huh. that he would walk down the railroad tracks uh -huh. and come to what we call the flats and play with some of the boys in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. wow. Wow. And some of the guys in the neighborhood, too, like Terry Davis, Jerry Gravett, Johnny Bennett, uh -huh. they would all play ball there. Uh -huh. And we would sit up on the banks and watch them. Now, I think that Mac told me that Jerry lived just a few blocks from here, uh, where we are in the community. So. Yes, just up the street, actually, here, uh -huh. um, at, on Cherokee Street. Uh -huh. And in 19... Well, we got married in 1967, uh -huh. and by that time I was working at Keniston because I had started there in 66. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I had worked for CA Overcash, uh -huh. which was a realtor, uh -huh. and um, he was selling houses in McGuire Heights, okay. and I would go over there on Sundays and show some of the houses. Oh, okay. Then later when I started working at Keniston, we lived in Marietta in an apartment that was $65 a month okay. that Dr. Clark owned. Uh -huh. And that way I could walk to work. Uh -huh. And he was working in Atlanta, and he would catch a ride and go to Atlanta. And we lived down there about a year and a half, mm -hmm. and then we built a house across the street up here up mm -hmm. on the hill in front of his parents. Oh, you built a house? Yes. His mm -hmm. parents owned that land across the street. Mm -hmm. So we, um, my uh, father-in-law kept saying, you know, y'all can have, y'all can have the land, you know, just build your house. My husband wouldn't go for that. <laughs> he would say, you know, we're going to buy it from you. Mm -hmm. So we purchased the lot and we built a house and we lived there 17 and a half years. Oh, man. And um, that was prior to us um, 
purchasing the lemon house and we used to walk past there mm -hmm. and you know take a walk down to the beach or whatever mm -hmm. and up from here on Cherokee Street mm -hmm. and we would look at that house and say mm -hmm. you know we always wanted to renovate a historic mm -hmm. house and we liked antiques and mm -hmm. things like that so uh, we passed there one day and we noticed that it was going to be on auction for sale. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's when my husband uh, we, and I decided that we would bid on it. Mm -hmm. So mentioning Ben and Sylvia Flanagan, mm -hmm. uh, they were also wanting to purchase the house. So my husband called and said, well, Sylvia's gone 5000 over. Well, we decided. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, just I'll just leave it up to you, you decide. So he went 5000 over, and that's how we ended up. Mm -hmm. But we sold our property here on Cherokee Street. We owned a um, rental house down in the Mill Village, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where the animal hospital is now. We own that house. Mm -hmm. And there were so many people that you know, was looking at the Lemon House and we wanted to make it, you know, mm -hmm. try to bring it back as close to mm -hmm. to what it uh, was prior. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a lot of work. I well, I'm going to talk about that, but I want to back up a little bit too because we've covered a lot of topics yes. in the last few minutes. Uh, you didn't go to the Eli Whitman School, so I guess you went to the Ackworth School. Ackworth Elementary. Okay. And, uh, and what year did you start? There? I started there in 1958. Okay. And um, actually, um, we could we rode the school bus, uh -huh. and we would um, the bus would come up to Coa Drive Mud Row, and we would catch the bus if we saw if we were a little late and saw the bus pass the house, we knew that we could catch it when it came back down the street. So sometimes we would do that. And usually on like Fridays, we would get up a lot earlier because we knew it was the end of the week. Mm -hmm. You know, go to school, get it over with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we would ask if we could go over to Clarkdale uh -huh. and catch the bus. And there was a, a little uh, building over there, uh -huh. a bus stop, and um, Mac Turner and the ones I had mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, uh, his his cousin Ralph McMicken and mm -hmm. some of the Jarrett family and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Adams family, mm -hmm. uh, Martha, they would come over and catch the bus mm -hmm. with us. And um, I'm getting my math mixed up. You said you started there in '58. Uh huh. And but you're going to be working by 65? Yes. So, how, uh, okay, so you, you, what grade were you in in 58? You, this is the first grade? Yes, yes. Okay. So, you were mighty young when you started working then, weren't you? Yeah, I was only 19. Let me make sure that I have the... You sure I wasn't 40 then? Okay, I was born in 45. Okay, so you'd have started school about 51, wouldn't you? I started school when I was seven. So that'd be 52? Okay, 52. Okay, okay. okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. And what I was thinking about, I think that threw me off a little bit, was in 1958. It's when I wrote my first poem. Oh, okay. That's what it was. And we had to um, stand up in front of the class and, and read our mm -hmm. poem. Uh -huh. And so that was the first poem that I had written, and it was called The Chewing Gum Rule. Chewing gum. Chewing gum rule. Rule. Yeah. Do you want to hear it? Sure. Okay. And it's the only one that I can remember word for word, the first one I okay. ever wrote. And um, so we had to write a poem, and it had to rhyme, which poems usually rhyme. Some do, some don't. Yeah. But... Um, and we, I stood up in front of the class, and it starts out. <laughs> it 
It seems to me that in every school, chewing gum is the biggest rule. About the time you feel at ease, the teacher says, trash can please. You say, no teacher, I have no gum. But still, you know you do have some. So out it comes and under the desk to keep it hid from all the rest. Then comes the next day of school. You forget about the chewing gum rule. The teacher spots you right away and says, now, this is your last day. I've caught you once or twice before. Now it's time to settle the score. So up to the principal, the head of school, and I'll never again forget the chewing gum rule. Mm -hmm. And when I was standing up in front of the class, I turned around and rubbed my back. <laughs> And everybody laughed, including the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> From the visit to the principal. Right, office. exactly. Do <laughs> uh, you remember who the teacher was? Uh, it was um, it was Miss. Uh, I'm not sure if I have her name right or not. Um, I know Miss Abbott was one of the teachers, mm -hmm. Bill Abbott. Mm -hmm. Mother was one of my teachers, so mm -hmm. it could have been her. Okay. Who were the blockers? The blockers, um, Billy Blocker and his wife Ann. Mm -hmm. And Ann was a Nicholson, so she was part of the Nichols home, okay. you know, the generations. Mm -hmm. And um, he was my um, basketball coach mm -hmm. in grammar school. Mm -hmm. And um, he was just, you know, they were just an inspiration. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, like the perfect couple, perfect family. Mm -hmm. And um, when he would teach us to play basketball, it was like he kind of let you did your, do your mm -hmm. own thing, mm -hmm. and then he would correct you later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he would stand up and show you, you know, this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. But you can use your own way of doing mm -hmm. the same thing as long as the results are still, mm -hmm. you know, come out the same. So, mm -hmm. so it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I would walk home after basketball practice from the grammar school to the mill village mm -hmm. and um, didn't think a thing, you know, then every, mm -hmm. everybody was, you know, where are you going, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd say, well, you know, I stayed after a basketball practice. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were looking out for you mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the way home. Yeah. And that's the way it was always in the Mill Village. There was, you know, everybody was just so friendly right. and they could sit on their front porches and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Now, I know at one time, uh, at least I think at one time, those were rental properties in right. the Mill Village, but somewhere yeah. along the line, they began selling them to yes, and I people that wanted to buy them. Right. And I have uh, the deed where my dad bought Is that right? your house in 1968. Is that right? Yeah, I have uh, the deed. And, um, and I know oftentimes people would really fix them up after they bought them. Yeah. Maybe not so much so when they're just renting, but right. when they became owners. But when uh, they were renting, um, actually the mill kept them up. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother, every, you know, every two or three years, you know, they would ask, do you need some painting done? And all, my mm -hmm. mother always wanted her kitchen painted. Mm -hmm. And it was always yellow. She wanted her kitchen painted yeah. yellow. Oh, they come in and paint They came in and paint want. whatever. You would just have to let them know ahead of time. And um, they also um, delivered coal, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for the, the coal burning heaters. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they, um, I think, you know, they charged a nominal fee for, for the coal, but the other projects they, they didn't Did charge for. it was a heater or you have a furnace? Or? No, it was uh, a just a standalone heater uh -huh. that you put coal in. Uh -huh. And I know that sometimes in the fall, the kids would get out and um, we would pick up pine cones uh -huh. to start the fire with. Uh -huh. And... Um, we had a kerosene can, which my brother, my youngest brother still has, mm -hmm. that uh, we would take down to, at that time, it was the Grogan store. Uh -huh. yeah. 
that was on the south end of Tacoa Drive, and we would go down there, or he, my brother, would go down there and get kerosene to start the fires with. And my particular bedroom that I that I uh, shared with my youngest sister, because we were the ones that were home the longest. <laughs> um, it had a fireplace, an open fireplace in it. Oh, okay. And um, I remember, you know, at night when we'd go to sleep, just looking up at the ceiling and mm -hmm. watching the fire flicker on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. But uh, it well, was some good times. That people think of Mill Village workers as being poor. Yeah. But the, all the Mill Villages I've ever seen look pretty nice. Yeah, and, and the thing about it is um, we had... Uh, Playgrounds that had a swings, uh, seesaws. We had a basketball court. Did the company put those in? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And we had a branch that we could uh -huh. wade in. Uh -huh. And and like I said, the ballpark. And a lot of us girls then, uh, we would go behind the bo the bleachers mm -hmm. in the ballpark and build you know little playhouses mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. the little sections behind the bleachers. Mm -hmm. And some of the boys would come tear them up sometimes, mm -hmm. but <laughs> that was just typical. But um, uh, when you went to school in Ackworth, did the kids from the Mill Village uh, uh, get along with the kids oh, from yeah. the rest of the? Oh yeah. Uh, and that's you know that's how. In fact, I have friends now still that I made in grammar school. And through high school, uh -huh. and it was just um, so there wasn't any prejudice against Mill. Village. Not, not that I could see, uh -huh. and um, it was just you know, small town, mm -hmm. neighborly, mm -hmm. just you know, good place mm -hmm. to grow up. Did you go to North Cobb High School? Yes, North Cobb High School. I played basketball yes, there right. also, uh -huh. and were you a good basketball yeah. player? I think so. <laughs> I played forward, even though I was short. Mm -hmm. I was still a pretty good player, mm -hmm. and uh, good ran track and stuff like that. So did you run on track? Uh, you know, like hundred yard, fifty mm -hmm. yard dash, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I think I did a um, not. Let's see, what would it be long jump, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, Betsy Brown, uh -huh. Betsy Lewis Brown, yes. uh, she was on the basketball team that mm -hmm. actually in grammar school and uh -huh. Northcott. We interviewed her just recently. Yeah. But like I said, you, you know, mm -hmm. you keep some of the friends that mm -hmm. you grew up with. and. Uh -huh. So you, you got out of high school, you, you worked for a realtor for a year. Then you should go to, to Kennestown. And why don't you talk a little bit about your experience at Kennestown? Because I think I saw that you were there something like 27 years. Yeah, I was there 27 years. Um, when I, I was still working for CA Overcash, and one of my friends, Betty Dean, uh, it's Betty Dean Casey now, mm -hmm. she was working there in uh, respiratory therapy, mm -hmm. and another friend, Barbara Harris at the time, was um, running a department mm -hmm. where, you know, did EKGs, um, cardiac testing. And um, she said, why don't you come to work at Keniston? Because, you know, they're needing some people in that in the EKG department. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. So I went down there in 1966 and um, I got preg pregnant with our daughter. Jerry and I had married in 67. I got mm -hmm. pregnant with our daughter seven and a half years later huh? And when we lived over here on Cherokee Street. Mm -hmm. And my husband said, you know, you don't have to go back to work if you don't want to, you know. Mm -hmm. Just stay home, raise our child. And um, so I had not really decided whether I was going to go back or not. Mm -hmm. I was on the three-month pregnancy leave. and. Um, they kept calling me, come back, come back, come back, because Barbara was leaving mm -hmm. and going to work in Dr. Fortson's office, mm -hmm. Luther Fortson. 
and um, oh, she's the one that married Dr. Forsen? Yes, oh, yeah, right, yes. Right, yeah. And um, Dr. Forsen used to be my doctor. Okay, yeah, yeah. he was very, very nice man. Uh, he was. And um, so they kept saying, and they were going to, um, the doctors kept saying, where's Sue, where's Sue? She knows how to run this department. Mm -hmm. So I told my husband, and I said, well, let me call and see, you know, how I, at that time they were building a daycare. Mm -hmm. So I called to see how much longer they were going to be on, you know, finishing the daycare. Mm -hmm. And they said, probably another month. And I said, well, if I can stay out another month, mm -hmm. then I'll come back to work so that I could take my daughter to the mm -hmm. daycare, mm -hmm. which was just right across the street. That was pretty progressive back then. To have oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. So I went back to work and went in the supervision, you mm -hmm. know, and then um, actually they changed it to director of the department as as mm -hmm. we started doing other tests, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, we did stress testing, uh, treadmill, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we started doing echoes. And um, it was just, uh, you know, situation that you you got into and you just you know just kept I, I really liked it mm -hmm. and I just kept progressing and uh, like I said got up to head of the department mm -hmm. and um, Dr. Fortson was instr instrumental too in getting the cardiac care unit mm -hmm. started so mm -hmm. um, it was a lot a lot of things to learn during that mm -hmm. time and a lot of it was learned through, um, we went to continuing education that was provided by then Kennesaw Junior. Uh -huh. And also, um, let's see, uh, there was another college that came down there. I think it was the one that's in Waluska. Oh, right. Uh, Reinhardt, uh -huh. yeah. And we would get, you know, continuing education through those that's colleges. So Okay. And we'd have certain hours of the day that we could go and attend. Uh -huh. Well, I guess you had dealings with Bernie Brown. If you were yes, and I think, as you know, I wrote a poem about working at Kennestone. You remember any of the poems? Um, not verbatim, but I could. I have it with me. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, it had some. He, he had asked that people um, come up with something that what they would do if they were the administrator uh -huh. of Kenneth Stone. So that's what I wrote it about. So I wrote this when uh, we always called him Mr. Brown, Bernie Brown, mm -hmm. <laughs> Bernard Brown. Uh -huh. He had asked uh, one day when we were in one uh, supervisor's meetings, he said, next meeting we have, he wanted um, us to uh, say what we would do if we were the administrator. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this poem. If I was the administrator of Kennestone, I would not carry the responsibilities alone. I would delegate to my subordinates and trust them as well to never forget what we're here to sell. Quality care delivered with a smile and a willingness to go that extra mile. I would acknowledge the persons mopping the halls the same as the ones on the boardroom walls. Mm -hmm. I would map the future from mistakes of the past and stay with the basics that seem to last. I would keep my visions on a steady course and accept my failures without remorse. I would cherish the friends I would make on my plight and keep their values well within sight. I would keep my mind open to their thoughts and their needs. If I could do all this, I would surely succeed. And this last version Mr. Brown was sitting there, and we were—I was standing up reading this poem. 
He asked for a copy, uh-huh. but the last of the poem, then I looked at him, and I pointed at him, <laughs> and I said, but after all is said and done, you know, we're not bad off with the present one. <laughs> Because I can say most definitely that I'm glad it's you, Mr. Brown, instead of me. (laughs) That's nice. Yeah. But it was, like I said, you know, some people say, you know, that's crazy that you would say that your job was fun, but, you know, there was a lot of good people there. Wow. Um, So you... You stopped, uh, why did you uh, retire in 93? You weren't that old. Well, a lot of things started changing. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, I think it became prominent. Okay. Prominent health care. I was thinking that was about the time of all the mergers. Yeah, and um, there were a lot of departments that were going to be um, integrated, mm-hmm. and it was just... Um, one of those things that um, I didn't want to try, we were going to have to go from hospital to hospital too. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do that. And that was actually, um, we were living in the Lemon House. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of things, you know, still going on there. And we had decided um, to sell the Lemon House back to the Lemon family. Mm-hmm. Because when we purchased it at auction, uh, they were not aware that the house, the Lemon family was not aware. Yes. Um, well, Mark Lemon, that lives there now, his, his parents, uh, they had left a, mess, uh, a letter in our mailbox, and we had only owned the house probably three months. And they told us they were not aware that it was out of the Lemon family, and they wanted to to buy it. Mm -hmm. And so my husband contacted Mark and said um, that we'd always wanted to to live in a historic house and renovate and Mm -hmm. all that. And so that they would be the first that he would uh, contact if we decide to sell it. So we did. Okay. Well, let's talk about, um, well, what, um, uh, talk first of all, you were living on uh, Cherokee Cherokee Street Street. And um, did that, wasn't there a fire in the Lemon House? There was. In fact, um, Ms. Lemon, um, trying to think of her first name, but her daughter's name was Sarah. And they both perished there in the fire from smoke inhalation. The, I, 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 where did the Nichols come in? The Nichols, um, well, the Nichols, uh, Miss Nick. Uh, the ones that lived in the Lemon House at the time were Nichols. And they're the ones that perished? Yes. Okay. And um, they, the, the families were merged through marriage. Oh, the Nichols and the Lemons? Right. I see. Yes. And so um, when the Nichols lived there and the house uh, caught on fire, and the two ladies perished in the fire. Um, I think at one time there was someone else living there afterward, but they didn't renovate the house. And um, what year was the fire? You know, I'm not sure exactly when the fire was, but Nancy Maxwell that lives down the street, Uh she had come home from, she was working at the post office and she had come home for lunch, and she saw smoke coming out, you know, from under the door. Oh. And she went she over. Yes, she spotted the, the smoke coming out. Mm-hmm. And um, this, um, I don't know if you believe in spirits or not, sure. but I can tell you a story that uh-huh. happened to me. After we bought the house, I was sitting at the front door on the floor, mm-hmm. washing some of the smoke off of the wainscoting there in the mm-hmm. front hall. Mm-hmm. 
And I heard someone say, Sue. Hmm. And I turned around and looked down the long hall to the back of the house because that's where the voice came from. And I said, I'm, I'm up here at the front. Just come on in. Nobody came in. Hmm. Didn't hear anybody. I said, I'm right here in front. So I got up, walked down the hall, went outside, walked around the house. <laughs> Nobody, Nobody was there. Mm -hmm. I came back in. So I thought, well, you know, I was just hearing something. Uh -huh. So I sat back down, started working on the wainscoting again. Uh -huh. And I heard this snickering, Snicker. like <laughs> laughing. Oh, and it was coming from upstairs, uh -huh. right? Where, uh, yeah, I was sitting close to the stairs at yeah. the front door. You got called the police at that time. Well, I, I got up and it got louder. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, okay, these are spirits in this house, which I've never called them ghosts. Mm -hmm. And I got up and I said, in a real strong voice, hey, you think you're scaring me? <laughs> no way. Look around you. Wouldn't you rather this house look better than this? So you're gonna have to leave us alone because we're not going anywhere. After that, there was a few other things that happened. My husband had put on a doorknob. Mm -hmm. It was at the top of the stairs. The first room, as you turn in the hall upstairs, was on the left. And I stood up there with him and handed him the tools as he was putting the doorknobs on because we had purchased some older mm -hmm. knobs to replace mm -hmm. the ones that were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he called me at work the next day when he got home and he said, did you take that doorknob off <laughs> that we just put on yesterday? It was gone? It was laying in the floor, oh but it was taken off of the door. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I wouldn't have any reason to do it. He said, you stood there and watched me and handed me the tools to put it on. I said, mm -hmm. yes. So he said, when you come home, I'm going to do the same thing. You stand there and you watch me. So he put it back on. And a few days later, he called me again. And he said, you're not going to believe this. And I said, the doorknob's off again? He said, no, it's turned backward. And he said, I remember you going inside, checking the lock from the inside, mm -hmm. and you know, everything was okay, and now it's turned backward. Mm -hmm. So we talked about it, and we decided that door didn't need a lock on it. <laughs> so we just put a pass-through mm -hmm. uh, knob on it, mm -hmm. and it never happened again. <laughs> Well, in that particular room, mm -hmm. there was a door that led into the attic mm -hmm. that went over the kitchen area. Mm -hmm. So we, we thought, you know, maybe that door didn't need to be locked because that was an in and out, mm -hmm. you know, for people that needed to hide or mm -hmm. get out fast or whatever. Okay. So it was strange, but... You know, I wasn't. I was never afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, to live in that house because we heard, we heard other voices and all. You know, particular at night, and we would punch each other in the bed to make sure the other one heard it at the same time. <laughs> okay, so um, there was a fire in the house, and then uh, people continued to live in the house. There was someone renting the house. I think after it was. That. Yeah, and it was. It was put on auction. Yes, there was two or three rooms on the right-hand side of the house that were not damaged. Okay. 
by the fire. Okay. But it was the left side of the house in the in the main hall. So looking from the front, the left side was the damage. Right, side. and it had the huge hall that went down the middle right. of the house. Right. Because at one time the kitchen area was uh, not attached uh -huh. to the house, mm -hmm. as they were in those days. Sure, sure. When you didn't want to have fires. From right the from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So everything to the left of the central hall was pretty badly damaged. Right. Uh, did the roof stay on? The roof, some of the roof was uh, damaged. And mm -hmm. of course, we had to do a lot of work. We had inside, outside, roof. Wow. In fact, when we bought it, it the whole side of the house was covered with kudzu. Wow. And well, now, who owned the house to put it on auction? I was it because they didn't pay their taxes? That was I'm, you know, I'm not sure if it was still in some of the Lemon family, mm -hmm. but um, or the Nichols family, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know. I just know that it was put up for auction. So you bought it real cheap and then put a ton of money into it. Yeah. Afterwards. At that time, it was fairly cheap, mm -hmm. but then we doubled or more you know that what sure. we paid for it. Sure. Yep. Okay, so so uh, you spent uh, you're still working at the hospital, but you're spending your spare time renovating. Right, and we did a lot of the work ourselves. Now, what is Jerry doing for a living? Well, he had worked at the post office. Uh -huh. He was a rule carrier. He started working uh, at the post office, and prior to that, he had worked at General Motors. Uh -huh. And they were always laying off, you know, and mm -hmm. also he decided that he was going to stick with the post office. Mm -hmm. And um, so he worked in Atlanta for a couple of years, and then he got transferred up here to, to Ackworth. Mm -hmm. And his total service for the post office was, uh, well, he retired with 40 years, mm -hmm. but 38 years of it was the service in two years that he was in the army, you know, went toward because it was civil service right, at that right. time. The post office wasn't that far from the house then. Right. So, yep. So, so you all just spent all your spare time renovating the house? And still doing it. And still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> because like I said, we, we, owned, uh, we bought his parents' house uh -huh. after they passed and um, had it and worked, did a lot of work on it. Uh, we so you moved, so, and that's the, the house that's just real near here. Right, right. So uh, what year was that that you bought that house? Um, it would have been in 93. Okay. When, after his parents died. So 93 died. is when you sold the women house? It's when we bought. No, I'm sorry, when we sold the lemon house, but we still owned his parents' house. Okay. Um, I just wanted to come out, uh, you know, we're doing, we're interviewing Mark Lemon on Thursday. Yeah, we, we bought the Lemon House in 83. 83 and then sold it in 93. Right. Because we've got an interview that one of my students did with Mark and his mother, and that was like November of 93, and I think they were in the house. Yeah, they were. They were. Mm -hmm. But um, I enjoyed living there, but uh, we'd always wanted to live out in the country. So we bought um, five acres out, you know, right. behind Emerson, which, oh, yeah, it's on Bates Road. So you moved from uh, Cherokee Street in Agworth to outside Emerson. Right. Mm -hmm. We have a Cartersville address, but we're right behind Emerson. Uh -huh. And uh, okay, so you wanted acreage, and you moved. Out yeah, we moved out there, um, and I designed that ho the house that we live in because. Uh -huh. uh, I took a lot of the features from the Lemon House, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people that come to our house think it's an older house that's been <laughs> renovated. Uh -huh. And because I used, like I said, uh, the Lemon House had uh, transoms over uh -huh. the window, I mean the doors uh -huh. and inside, and um, mm -hmm. French doors, double French doors, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's what you know we put in our house, and I knew which furniture I was going to mm -hmm. take, so um, I made sure the walls were big enough for it because 
we had acquired a lot of antiques by that time. You were talking before we started the interview about how the, the, the walls were so bad that the plaster was destroyed. Well, some of the plaster was, was destroyed, and uh, my husband, he would knock the plaster out, oh. and uh, I would get down and, you know, rake it all up and take it off. So you, you all know. did all the work yourself? A lot of it. We had... Um, some of it was subcontracted. Of course, the things like uh, we had the total electric, you know, everything was done mm -hmm. over and because we didn't want to take any chances, you know, with the electrical mm -hmm. and all the plumbing and mm -hmm. then furnaces, one in the attic, one in the cellar, mm -hmm. and, you know, just just a lot of work like that. But mm -hmm. we had some friends that were, were in the uh, construction mm -hmm. business in fact, one of the one of the friends, uh, Ricky White, which his parents later uh, had bought the Grogan's old store mm -hmm. down to South End of Tacoa Drive, uh, mm -hmm. Alton and uh, Gene White, mm -hmm. and their sons Donnie and Ricky, mm -hmm. um, and they were an integral, you know, part of the community there mm -hmm. because, uh, and Ricky is a um, builder. And so the house that we're in now, he uh, subcontracted. Uh -huh. A lot of work in, in the way you're looking at it. Yeah, but we just got through with another project. So mm -hmm. we're, and my husband also helps a lady that purchased four houses in the Mill Village. Mm -hmm. And um, we go back and forth over there when she needs help. And, mm -hmm. Actually, all he does is just get in touch with people that he knows, mm -hmm. and you know, from over the years mm -hmm. of of the renovating. So, uh, yeah, well, that's great. Well, talk a little bit about uh, your memories of Ackworth and what you like about Ackworth. Well, it's changed a lot, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, but when I come through Ackworth now, I always think of you know when I grew up there, mm -hmm. here. And um, it's just the memories, you mm -hmm. know, of being a good town, mm -hmm. uh, good people. Mm -hmm. um, that's mainly what I think of. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of progress. Some of it is good. And um, a lot of it is just so different. You have to take time to get used to it, mm -hmm. but I have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad, you know, that uh, Ackworth has grown like it has. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a great place to think about growing up. I'm about out of questions. Anything you'd like to add? Well, if I could just say one thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is, I'm writing about growing up in the Mill Village, mm -hmm. and this is the first sentence, and I want to say it in a very meaningful way. Mm -hmm. No matter how old you get, or how many friends you make along the way, you never forget the friends you grew up with. Mm 